Russell, exciting news. Critical Metals put out an outstanding news release, starting with a 1.63 million pound raise. What are you planning on doing with these funds? Well, I'm, thank you for having me, Tracy. I'm very excited about this raise. It was oversubscribed in, in what many people refer to as a difficult and tricky market. The uh, first order of business is to rehabilitate this road. It's a 28 kilometer long road between ourselves and um, and one of the villages. And it has used been used by local villagers to transport logs um, along the road. And it was degraded over the rain period. And in fact, we saw four times the amount of traffic that uh, we had normally seen. And hence the reason why we need to make this an all weather road. And what we're doing is, is there's three areas that are particularly wet. We're putting in culverts there. We're uh, going to bevel and angle the road so the drainage is proper. We have a compactor ready to go to compact it. And then we're going to put layers of stone, both dolomite and, and laterite. Laterite actually will dissolve and make a, a, a cement type of process on this road. So we're going to do that. We're going to start hopefully uh, in the next few days, certainly next week. And um, it'll take us anywhere between 60 and 90 days to complete this road. Um, what we're also going to do with the capital is we need to finish up our Diamond Deal program. The Diamond Deal costs about $170 per meter. We can drill about 30 meters a day. Um, and we need uh, the extra 1,000 meters to add to our previous 1,000 meters in order to uh, build some type of block model and ideally a mine plan, along with creating a jerk report, which the market is eagerly waiting for. Um, also, nice. too, with a portion of that capital, we are going to um, uh, pay our uh, fee for the OTC QB listing that we've been uh, working on the last four months or so. It's the, the basically the last fee before we get the approval, uh, and it's the fee to the broker for the introduction letter. So we hope to be trading on uh, the U.S. market, OTC, QB market, uh, in the next 30 days or so, which will open up a whole new avenue of investors. And of course, I've been watching your career for the last decade and a half, so we know how you achieve milestones and stealth-like pace. So many people may not appreciate what our group notices about your company, which is that you often go to the Congo. You're not just another company with a Congo asset. You're actually there frequently, but you're based in the U.S. Is that correct? So I'm based in, technically in London. Um, I travel to North America a lot because I think North America is going to be a growth market for, for the company. We have a subsidiary uh, registered in the U.S. Um, and an office in the U.S., and that allows us to take advantage of some of the the funding programs that the U.S. government offers. Um, for example, the Exxon Bank uh, provides loan guarantees to companies that are operating in the uh, DRC at single digit type lending rates. Um, the DFC is very active in the continent of Africa and, and is looking for both uh, lending equity stakes and also grants uh, to uh, emerging uh, mining companies in, uh, in Africa. And in fact, I know a company in Uganda that actually recently received uh, some DFC uh, grant capital, and we're after the same program. So being based uh, on an airplane, but technically in London with a subsidiary office in, in the U.S. is uh, where I am when I'm not sitting at the mine in the DRC. Well, you, you, you touched on a few things I had wanted to bring up, starting with your the term sheet that was mentioned for $11 million uh, loan from a partner. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Sure. So the trip sheet was for $11 million on a gross basis. It was $10 million for uh, CAPEX, which is for the plant, and a $1 million for OPEX for uh, for the company itself. Um, the, the terms were actually very compelling. And if one would think about the risk-free rate of a country like the Congo, it's dollar-denominated debt. Um, once they... Uh, remembered that the U.S. government is guaranteeing this loan, the extra terms got reduced and the payment uh, timeline has been extended and a holiday granted. Um, they're busy re, uh, rewriting the term sheet and we expect the term sheet to come back, I think tomorrow actually. Um, that's from the first uh, financing institution. The second financing institution who says that they were going to uh, provide a term sheet, um, that one is yet to come. We expect it to come in the next week or two. And then, of course, uh, yesterday, there was a meeting uh, with the DFC in Washington, D.C. to uh, talk about uh, this grant capital that we're after. 
And uh, that that application went in in December, and it's being moved along quite nicely. And interestingly enough, one of the senators out of Connecticut is championing our uh, our cause uh, to the DFC and saying, you know, we need to get this uh, we need to get this application down to the the final approval uh, decision. We often talk about ESG and sustainability, and in particular, strategic relations with the community. And I was deeply moved by a video I saw about a school that you had built in your community. Can you tell us a little bit more about your investment in the community? Sure. So we had about 53 employees, of which two only two were not Congolese. And out of those 51 that were left, um, two of them that were doing mining for us in June, July, were actually qualified school teachers. And so what we did is we went to the chief and then went to the village. We asked permission for the chief. If the villagers approved to build a school, would he allow it? And he said, of course. And so we took these two uh, gentlemen that were mining for us, and we said, we want to build you a school. And so we went to the village and said, would you like uh, like a school? And they said, of course. So we want to, went and purchased a brick-making uh, machine. Uh, we went and found uh, some anthill dirt, anthills. And anthill dirt actually compacts quite nicely in the bricks and uh, reacts quite favorably in a kiln environment. And uh, we said to uh, about four different uh, gentlemen, here's the machine, here's the anthill uh, dirt. And we put, uh, gave them a water source and said, make us bricks. And once you're ready, you can sell them back to us at eight cents a brick. Now it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think of the thousands and thousands and thousands of bricks, it will take for us to not only build the school, but also uh, build the camp. So we built the school and had it operating in September. And it was an unbelievable success. And it brought incredible goodwill. Uh, and in fact, in October, November, when the government, uh, when the officials from Washington, D.C. were there, they were incredibly moved by um, the small but unique and um, a school full of enthusiasm and, 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 and hope. And so the next um, idea that we have there is we want to put Wi-Fi into the school and go to one of the foundations like a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and ask for computers. So what will happen is, is our teachers will be able to not only use just the Blackboard, but we'll be able to uh, teach these students really what's out there uh, in, this, in this great world that we live in and give them hope that they can achieve something. And recently we've been asked to build a second school uh, by another by the other side of the property, the lease area which um, I'll talk about when I get down there and just see um, how we can do this. And um, what I'm thinking about now is um, building a, the, a small church for the current village, which has the school. Um, and I think that this community relations, and certainly with the chief and the villagers, is, is really key. What's interesting, though, is just two days ago, I received a picture on, on my phone of a, a, a group of uh, tomatoes. And what's happened is, is we finally have our first tomato um, uh, uh, harvest from our community garden. And what we've done is we've hired other villagers um, and we've built a, a, a massive garden by a stream. Uh, so we have plenty of water and we, we grow orca, we grow lettuce, we grow uh, tomatoes, we grow, we grow carrots, we grow, we grow all sorts of vegetables. And what we do is we pay uh, the caretakers there to harvest and supply the camp. Um, and so it's a little micro economies that we're building to help the village where there's there has been no employment. Um, and it was very uh, it was very enlightening this morning when I called down to Malulu and they said, no, our, our carrots should be ready by the time you, uh, you get here. So I'll take some pictures of um, the carrot harvest that we hope to have soon and uh, put them on the internet. So just to, for everybody out there that's going, hey, who is this Critical Metals? How about you just provide a couple of competitive reasons why Critical Metals is such an exciting project for investors following the critical mineral sector to pull up their sleeves and do some due diligence on? Sure. So the Manila project is a past producing uh, copper cobalt mine. Um, there is a cobalt area where there are two pits where the artisans were taken, but we're focusing right now on the copper. So we are going to be in production in 2024, right? So there's very few companies that have gone from development stage into uh, production stage uh, at this type of market cap. 
and this quickly. Number two, copper price has actually changed a lot. Um, right now, it's at about 9,300 or so. We saw the Bank of America come out and say they expect a 30% rise in the copper price uh, within the next 12 months. And when we were doing our, our, our modeling and figures, we started at 7,500. Um, we bumped it to 8,500 just to see what kind of margin expansion there is. And at 9,300, you know, our margins expand by about 20% or so by selling a DSO or direct shipping copper ore to the market. Um, number three, we always look at polymetallic deposits. And so one of, I will be going to two other countries on this trip to look at, uh, to do due diligence on uh, tin, uh, tungsten, uh, tantalum uh, mines, and uh, another uh, mine that I'd rather keep uh, quiet for now until I get there. And, you know, we look at, uh, spreading out the EBITDA over several countries in several different mineral, mineralized pits or mineralized uh, mines. So ideally what happens is, is we uh, do several acquisitions this year, one, at least two, and uh, turn around and add that to the uh, copper profitability and the copper um, sales that we have and turn around and make this uh, a more stable EBITDA uh, type company that will allow us to uh, increase I think immensely as the critical minerals and the critical metals thesis continues to grow, not only in, in, in the West, but also uh, in the Far East and Asia and places like Japan, South Korea. Russell, normally we ask companies to tell us what we should be looking forward to in the next quarter, but I'm not going to let you answer that question. What we would prefer, since you're so hard to track down, is that you come back in six weeks and provide an update. Can you give me that Promise that we're going to see you in six weeks for an update, please. Absolutely. I look forward to updating uh, everybody here um, in the CMI uh, in the Investor News uh, world. Thank you. And for everybody out there interested in more information, please go to the following Critical Metals website. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Tracy, for having me.